Coming up, Han Solo is ticked. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. We'll tell you what in the wonderful world of aviation has Harrison Ford worked up. If you fly a Cherokee, FAA has something new for you. We fly the super-fast light aircraft that befuddles U.S. regulators. And drones to the rescue. AOPA Live this week begins in just a moment. Build and fly with the Sonics Aircraft B-Models. The B-Models offer more room and comfort, more fuel, more panel space, more engine choices, and the same great Sonics Aircraft flight characteristics. Learn more at sonicsaircraft.com. This is AOPA Live This Week with Tom Haynes and Melissa Rudinger. What it wouldn't do is protect the freedom, security, and fairness of American aviation. Harrison Ford is steamed. The pilot and actor is a vigorous defender of our American freedom to fly, and he thinks the plan to give air traffic control to an airline-run monopoly is a threat to all of us. The venue was the Living Legends of Aviation Gala in Beverly Hills, and Ford took the opportunity to make an impassioned plea. There's a, a bill currently stalled in the House called H.R. 2997 that could vastly affect the future of general aviation. Its proponents are calling it privatization. It's not privatization. It's a control grab by the airline industry and their allies in Congress. It's a multi-billion dollar special interest giveaway of a national asset. Yet the airlines blame everything from delayed flights to outdated technologies on general aviation in the ATC. 50% of their delays are caused by their own inefficiencies and the other 30% by weather. Privatization might never happen. It might be dead in the water, but sponsors of the bill are committed to continuing to push it, and it may reappear as part of the administration's infrastructure initiative. Let's hope not. Ford was there to present an award to another opponent of privatization, Senator Jim Inhofe of Oklahoma. More on that in a moment, but first, a quick explanation of why this ATC thing is just not going away. On March 31st, the FAA ceases to exist, at least on paper. That's when a bit of legislation called the FAA authorization expires. Congress has two choices at that point. Extend, again, the current authorization, that's kind of a stopgap measure, or enact a new multi-year authorization. That's the bill in front of the House right now, H.R. 2997, which includes giving ATC to a nonprofit monopoly. AOPA opposes that effort, but supports the idea of a multi-year authorization. Now, another way Congress could change who controls ATC is through the upcoming infrastructure bill that the president has been speaking about. Regardless, you should know that powerful interests like the Trump administration, some members of Congress, the airlines, and other big businesses want to wrest control of ATC away from the FAA and the majority of the system users like you and me. And they have several avenues to potentially do that in all in play at the same time. And that's why our office in DC is keeping a watchful eye and we need your support to fend off these efforts. So it's against that backdrop that Harrison Ford got so fired up at the awards show in Beverly Hills. Ford presented the Aviation Legacy Award to Oklahoma Senator James Inhofe for his work in fighting ATC privatization and for his support of Pilots' Bill of Rights, medical certificate reform, and for being the strongest advocate for general aviation in the United States Senate for more than two decades. And actor and pilot John Travolta inducted our boss, AOPA President and CEO Mark Baker, into the living legends of aviation. I have enjoyed my life as an aviator, owned over 100 different airplanes and flown to over 10,000 hours in different places. But coming to celebrate this freedom to fly, which it was because of these four, five guys around Philadelphia in 1939, that have convened what I consider to be the best airspace in the world. I thank you for your membership. I thank you for your support of AOPA. I thank for what we do and how lucky we are in this United States, because it is really, really fun to fly in this country. The Living Legends of Aviation Gala raises funds for the Kitty Hawk Foundation, which works to encourage young kids to become interested in aviation. You can read more about the honorees on our websites. 
so you were there. I was there. It was a good time. It's uh, always a fun party. Uh, a lot of interesting people there. I, I could do without the tuxedo, though. You know? <laughs> I bet Mark could, too, but I, yeah, it was nice right. to see him get recognized. It's nice to see him get dressed up once in a while, too. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Now here's a staggering number. The FAA's National Drone Registry is now more than one million recreational and small commercial unmanned aircraft users. That includes some 880,000 hobbyists. Hobbyists and small commercial drone operators must register through the FAA's website. By the way, if you're interested in drones, AOPA has a free bi-weekly newsletter on them. You can subscribe to any or all of our newsletters on our website. And small unmanned aerial systems can be pretty darn useful in a variety of ways, like rescues. Late last month, out on the Oregon coast, a drone figured in the rescue of Felix the Border Collie. The poor pooch spent the night precariously perched on a seaside cliff. Local fire chief Matt Verley, who is a private pilot and a drone pilot, responded to calls for help to find Felix. Considering the train, he figured the drone was better suited to the task than his Cessna 172. He found Felix in only about 10 minutes and helped direct the rescue. Wow. I think those are tears of joy. And down under, a drone saved two teens caught in 10-foot surf in a strong undertow. New South Wales lifeguards used a Little Ripper drone to drop an inflatable rescue pod to the struggling swimmers. It took only about 70 seconds to fly the drone to the swimmers. Lifeguards said it would have taken them about six minutes to get to the boys otherwise. Pretty remarkable use of a drone. That's amazing. That's scary to be lost at sea like yeah, that, really. practically. It's, uh, good stories, though. When we come back, if you fly a Cherokee, you need to know about this. And we fly an aircraft as sleek and as fast as its namesake. AOPA Live this week it continues after this. Meet the pilots who fly with AOPA Insurance. They love flying and saving money, just like you. At AOPA Insurance, we understand how you fly and provide the coverage you need to keep on flying. Call for a free quote and see which AOPA Insurance plan is right for you. Welcome back. Well, say goodbye to upside down wedding cakes, maybe. You may recall that description of Class Bravo airspace from your student pilot days, or if you're really old like me, it was a terminal control area. But AOPA has long argued that it's an inefficient use of airspace. And more and more, the FAA is now moving towards Class Bravo layouts based on actual arrival and departure routes. The latest airspace redesign is the San Francisco Class B. And while the proposed airspace comes closer to the ideal, AOPA still thinks there are areas not well designed for the needs of general aviation pilots. The proposal is now open for comments. Check our story online for more information and how to give your feedback to the FAA. So you've been working on these things forever. Forever, yeah. We have an ad hoc process that actually AOPA championed years ago that the FAA follows. And we were on the group. We helped design or, or make the recommendations for this new design. We think it does address some of our needs. It's, it's not a bad design, but we think there's some areas where they've taken a little bit too much air space. And so we're going to keep pushing to tweak it so that okay. it, it benefits everybody. Well, good. And it's glad to hear the FAA is willing to work with us. Absolutely. Yeah. And now some upcoming airspace restrictions to tell you about. One week from this Sunday, it's going to be some kind of a sporting event in Minneapolis. I may have heard about it. With it comes a 10 nautical mile no-fly ring around U.S. Bank Stadium and a flight restricted zone stretching further out. Details are on our website, including links to the FAA's flight advisory and letter to airmen. But even before that, flying in the Washington, D.C. area is going to get even more complicated. Next Tuesday is the President's State of the Union Address to Congress. And that means many of the special access procedures for the Washington Special Flight Rules area will be suspended and other operations will be prohibited. Be sure to check NOTAMs and check in with Flight Service as if it's not complicated enough to fly in D.C. If you fly a Piper Cherokee, double check the fuel selector. The FAA has just issued an airworthiness directive requiring inspection and, if necessary, replacement of the fuel selector placard. It seems that on some aircraft, the placards misidentify the left and right tanks. The AD affects nearly 18,000 PA-28 models. The FAA says the inspection must be completed before further flight after February 7th. One guy who has an awful lot of flight Flight time is our boss, Mark Baker. More than 10,000 hours in 100 different aircraft, and he knows a thing or two because, well, he's seen a thing or two, which makes him a good guest for the Air Safety Institute's There I Was podcast. In the discussion, hear what Mark learned from multiple engine failures through the years, like the time he lost his engine in a T6. 
And all I could find, it was over a bunch of trees and swamps and kind of northern mid-Minnesota. And uh, I started setting up for a small pasture that had a horse in it. Yeah, I'll never forget it, with a tree down, kind of laying next to a pond. And I made the decision. A lot of uh, friends and warbirds questioned the decision whether it was right or not. It turned out to be okay. I was putting the landing gear down because I was, wanted to make sure I could uh, sling it sideways if I got into this. It was going to be less than 600 feet of roll. Mm. Um, and trying to do something to burn up energy. Uh. You can find the There I Was podcast under Training and Safety, Air Safety Institute on our website. Mark's got some good stories. He does have good stories. I'm going to stop flying with him, though. <laughs> I don't know. He's got experience. <laughs> well, he does. He started flying, you know, just a couple years before I did, and he's had like three or four engine failures in single engine and multi engine airplanes. And so far, I've had none. So I don't know whether he's, maybe I should fly with him more because he's certainly run out of them by now. I don't know. Anyhow, finally, over in Europe, there's a boom on the light end of the market. Several companies have developed new super efficient and fast airplanes. AOPA editor large Dave Hirschman had a chance to fly one of these new airplanes called the Shark. Like its namesake, the Shark is sleek, quick, and efficient. It's the uh, fastest European ultralight airplane, and its record is 333 kilometers per hour. I think that's about 200 miles per hour, about 180 knots. Normal cruise speed is 146 knots with a 100 horsepower Rotax engine sipping just 5.5 gallons an hour of car gas. You know, I, I tell everybody it's a 27 gallon tank, just like an F-150, except you can get from here to Florida in one tank at 150 knots. The Shark is also a blast to fly. Fighter pilot friends say it feels just like a, a fighter. You know, it's as small as an A4, sticks just like, a, it's got a side stick like an F-16. It's got a glass cockpit, just like all the modern aircraft out there. The Shark is part of a new wave of modern light sport airplanes designed and built in Europe. It's made in the, the Slovak Republic, uh, Slovakia, in a little town called Zenica. Uh, that part of the world's kind of a hotbed for light sport aircraft right now. The Shark follows European regulations for ultralight aircraft, which, somewhat surprisingly, are far less restrictive than our own light sport aircraft category. Europe imposes weight limits, but like the Autobahn, there's no speed limit. And speed enhancing retractable landing gear and variable pitch propellers are allowed. The Shark is a revelation because it shows that vast improvements in speed and efficiency are available at the extreme light end of the general aviation market. Right now, the Shark is only available as an amateur-built kit or a fully manufactured airplane in the experimental exhibition category. But the company is considering applying for exemptions to U.S. rules that currently block it from the light sport aircraft category. If approved, fast, efficient, modern airplanes like the Shark could someday bring new life to that category and the broader aviation market as well. Dave Hirschman, AOPA Live. The Shark costs around $150,000. It's a pretty smoking airplane. It is. There's a lot of innovation in Europe that we don't get to see here, unfortunately. But maybe over time, they can get it certified yeah, here. But yeah, that would be fun to fly in only five gallons an hour of car gas. Low, low burn in fuel and yeah. lower price than what we see here. That's for sure. Uh, that's a wrap for this week. Thanks so much for spending your time with us. We hope to see you here again next Thursday for another edition of AOPA Live This Week. Purchasing your own aircraft is an exciting experience. AOPA Finance simplifies the process, saving you money with lower interest rates and hassle-free loans, so you get into your new aircraft sooner. AOPA Finance, the right approach to buying an aircraft.